his enemies. Stoker was inspired by it to write a very bad novel. It's a journey of initiation that some traditions associate with Vlad Tepesh. Most likely because Vlad was called Dracula, which means the dragon or the devil. But it's more related to occultism than to history. Professor Bokzov will fill you in better than I can. I assume she took some of your blood? She gets everybody to contribute. Irina Buksov? I tried to contact her, but I was rejected. She's incredibly mistrustful. It's a shame, because I, I, I think she knows a great deal about the Path of the Dragon. Do you have her phone number? Who knows, maybe I'll be luckier than you. Do you think so? Possibly. You're a priest. That inspires trust. Call 445-827 in Budapest. But whatever you do, don't say you know me. Number, please. This is Irina Boxoff. This is Father Arno Moriani. Hello, Professor. At the request of my hierarchy, I'm investigating the persistence of certain superstitions. You are an authority on questions of folklore and popular beliefs. You flatter me. Let's say that I have had the good fortune to inherit the library of my predecessor, Professor Hermann von Bergen. But tell me, what exactly is your investigation focused on? The belief in those imaginary creatures called... vampires. Vampires? You're interested in vampires? Just to demystify them, the Catholic Church wants to fight this superstition. Hmm. I have serious reserves about getting into the subject. I am in great demand, you know. Could you be more precise about the framework in which you're conducting your inquiry? I was entrusted with it by Monsignor Felicio Briganti of the Congregation of Rites. If need be, you can contact him by calling Vatican 63. Your references are serious. I'll accept to help you, Father, but I don't trust the telephone. Could you visit me at my office in Budapest? Certainly. As early as tomorrow, if it's all right with you. Very good. I'll expect you. Oh, I forgot. I was told that you possess a volume related to my inquiry. A biography of Vlad Tepesh? That's true. Professor von Bergen left me Michel Beheim's account in verse. It's a 15th century manuscript, very precious. But did you know that the German prose version was reprinted in 1905? It's a brochure entitled Geschichte Dracola Vida, brought out by the Friends of the Vatican Library. Published by the Friends of the Vatican Library? In that case, it won't be difficult for me to procure a copy. Goodbye, Professor. Goodbye, Father. Number, please. This is Cardinal Felicio Briganti. This is Father Arno Moriani. I intend to go have a discussion with Professor Irina Boxoff in Budapest to complete my file on vampires. Very good. Will you be coming back to Rome directly afterwards? If you don't see any problem with it, I'll go back to Vladoviste first. 
I'll be more tranquil there to write up my conclusions. Ah, an excellent idea. You'll be able to take advantage of the fresh country air. <laughs> I also plan on spending a week or two in the country. I almost forgot. Could you have a work that was published by the Friends of the Vatican Library sent to me? Certainly. It's a bound volume, Geschichte Dracula Vida, reprinted in 1905. No problem. I'll send it to you at your inn. Let me insist on one point, Arno. For your research, it's important that you consult the best scientific experts. We need the authority of a doctor and a historian to support your conclusions. I understand. And after you've finished your work, make sure you get some rest. Goodbye, Your Eminence. Be well, Arno. Number, please. Alba Eula, put me through to Germany. Munich, 321941. This is Professor Heinrich von Kruger. This is Father Arno Moriani. Professor, I'm calling back to ask for your help. Hmm. How can I help you? Well, it's rather delicate to explain. You should know, first of all, that I belong to the Holy Congregation of Rites. I came to Vladiviste to investigate the life of Martha Kelegarl. Would you like me to talk to you about her? She was a remarkable woman. To tell the truth, my mission has changed. For reasons that would be a little long to explain, I now have to investigate vampires. Vampires? <laughs> Don't tell me. The Catholic Church has started to believe in vampires. <laughs> On the contrary, my superiors want to combat this belief. They're alarmed to see how resistant it still is in the 20th century. Ah, yeah, very good. If it's to fight superstition, you can count on my assistance. It will be invaluable to me, for I need the viewpoint of a scientist on the vampire myth. Do you realize this is the very subject of the research I was carrying out with Dr. Kalugarl? We discovered a disease, the P syndrome, whose symptoms are quite similar to those attributed to the victims of vampires. So the legend is based on specific medical facts. Dr. Kellergarl contacted me while she was caring for a patient called Marescu. His granulocytes showed a very curious anomaly. She sent me a blood sample by carrier pigeon, and we worked on this case together. The result of our collaboration was the discovery of P syndrome. Afterwards, we had to specify the cause of the disease and perfect a serum. For that, I needed statistical data. I asked Dr. Caligaro to take a large number of samples from the population of Vladiviste. Unfortunately, the war interrupted our research. Did you pick up again with Martha Caligaro after the end of the hostilities? It wasn't possible for me to contact her immediately. When I was finally able to phone the dispensary, she was dead. It was Dr. Florescu who answered me. Of course. I've been insisting for some time now that she do so. As soon as she sends me the results I'm missing, I'll be able to find a serum that's effective against P syndrome. I just say that they're not supernatural creatures, but there certainly do exist mentally ill people who are bloodthirsty. Look at Countess Elizabeth Batori, who in the 16th century bled to death hundreds of young girls before she was walled up alive in her Carpathian castle. In addition, as I mentioned, patients afflicted with the P syndrome suffer from very odd physical and psychological disorders that make them resemble the victims of vampires. Oh, what did these patients do? They went out alone in the night, as if they were answering a call. They ripped off the garlic necklaces the doctor had placed on them. Somnambulism, allergy to garlic. Those signs are most likely associated with P syndrome, as are pallor, drawn features, anemia, and other symptoms we haven't yet discovered. Unfortunately, yes. What an abominable novel. You're too severe. That's not what Oscar Wilde thought. 
I won't tell you what I think of Oscar Wilde, and I'll limit myself to the novel. It's a tissue of inconsistencies. Let's see. Stoker affirms that those who die as victims of a vampire should become one in turn. So at that rate, vampirism should spread like an epidemic, with a growth rate faster than Fibonacci's famous immortal sequence. In a first stage, all of mankind would be vampirized, and then, in a second, the vampires would also disappear, not having any victims left to feed on. So, Stoker's hypothesis is therefore perfectly absurd. No species can live without regulation. Stoker considers himself a historian and a scientist, but he's just an oddball. His novel is a collection of implausibilities. Take the character of Lucy. That woman, he keeps saying, is getting better until she just dies. A victim of Dracula, she's treated by transfusion. Blindly, of course, because at the time, we knew nothing of blood types. In those conditions, what are the chances the patient will accept the donor's blood? About one out of three, if my recollections are good. Nonetheless, in desperate cases, it's worth the trouble to try. Certainly. But the good Professor von Helsing, who is always described as a genius, repeated the operation with four different donors. The chances of survival for that poor Lucy then fell to less than 2%. It's probably the transfusions that killed her, and not Dracula. Let's get back to Van Helsing, supposedly an expert on vampires. He teaches us that they can read minds and change into bats. However, he's not worried about finding one of the latter at the window of the room in which he's holding a meeting. And then he seems so surprised that Dracula knows his plans. <laughs> The naivety of that character is irritating. Yeah, I know the work of Murnau. They call it expressionism. But for me, those morbid fantasies have much more to do with pathology. Tell me, could I ask you a personal question? Listening to your voice, I have the feeling that you're a little tense. Yes, I'm not sleeping well. Nothing else? You can confide in me. I'm a doctor, you know. Well, sometimes I get the feeling I'm being spied upon. I'm sure it's only an impression, but it's becoming an obsession. Father Arno, you are sensitive and susceptible, like our late lamented Dr. Caligaro. These are qualities, but they make you vulnerable. Above all, don't let your imagination govern you. That's good advice. Thank you. I'll try to follow it. Goodbye, Professor. Goodbye, Father. He used to correspond regularly with Martha before the war. He didn't believe in vampires. According to him, the victims were sick people who needed to be cured. Martha shared his opinion at the beginning. It was during the war that she understood the truth. Ozana, I'm leaving for Budapest for a day or two. Would you please keep my room? Well, that is... Naturally, I'll pay you for my keep, even for the nights that I'm not here. In that case, of course, Father. I'll keep your room for you. Luana. Certain things, but I also know the virtues of silence. As much as I want to know. I have a feeling that before the end you will know more than me about the dragon. <laughs> <laughs> 